last modified on February 23, 2015, at 2153. Birdman, Film. Colton Carter. Theatrical release poster. Directed by. Alejandro G. Inaritu. Produced by. Alejandro G. Inaritu. John Lesher. Arnon Milchan. James W. Scotch Depole. Written by. Alejandro G. Inaritu. Nicholas Jacobone. Alexander Dinleris, J.R. Armando Bo. Starring. Michael Keaton. Zach Galifianakis. Edward Norton. Andrea Riseborough. Amy Ryan. Emma Stone. Naomi Watts. Music by. Antonio Sanchez. Cinematography. Emmanuel Lubisky. Edited by. Douglas Grice. Stephen Murioni. Production. Companies. Regency Enterprises. New Regency Pictures. M Productions. L.E. Grisby Productions. TSG Entertainment. Worldview Entertainment. Distributed by. Fox Searchlight Pictures. Release Dates. August 27, 2014, Venice. October 17, 2014, United States. Running Time. 119 Minutes. Country. United States. Language. English. Budget. $16.5 million. Box Office. $76.6 million. Birdman or, The Unexpected Virtue of Ignorance, often referred to simply as Birdman, is a 2014 American black comedy drama film CO written, CO produced, and directed by Alejandro Gonzalez in Aratu. It stars Michael Keaton, with a supporting cast of Zach Galifianakis, Edward Norton, Andrea Riseborough, Amy Ryan, Emma Stone, and Naomi Watts. The story follows protagonist Regan Thompson, a faded Hollywood actor famous for his role as superhero Birdman, as he struggles to mount a Broadway adaptation of a short story by Raymond Carver. Aside from a few shots near the beginning and end, Birdman appears to be filmed in a single shot, an idea the director had since the film's conception. This required an atypical production approach, with many elements of post-production needing to be considered before principal photography. As a result the script took two years to write, the cast went through several weeks of meticulous rehearsals, and during shooting takes were cut for the slightest mishaps. It was filmed in New York City during the spring of 2013 with a budget of $16.5 million, jointly financed by New Regency and Fox Searchlight Pictures. The film premiered the following year in August where it opened the 71st Venice International Film Festival. Birdman was given a limited theatrical release in the United States on October 17, 2014, followed by a wide release on November 14, and has grossed more than $76 million worldwide. It garnered critical acclaim, with praise particularly directed to the cast's performance and Emmanuel Lubisky cinematography. It is widely considered to be one of the best films of 2014, and has received multiple awards and nominations. These include winning Best Screenplay and Best Actor at the 72nd Golden Globe Awards, Outstanding Cast in a Motion Picture at the 21st Screen Actors Guild Awards, and nine nominations at the 87th Academy Awards, the joint most for the ceremony with the Grand Budapest Hotel. The film won four Academy Awards for Best Picture, Best Director, Best Original Screenplay, and Best Cinematography. Plot Regan Thompson, Michael Keaton, is a washed-up Hollywood actor famous for playing the superhero Birdman in blockbuster movies decades earlier. Regan is tormented by the voice of Birdman, who criticizes him, and he sees himself performing feats of levitation and telekinesis. Regan hopes to reinvent his career by writing, directing, and starring in a Broadway adaptation of Raymond Carver's short story What We Talk About When We Talk About Love. The play is produced by Regan's best friend and lawyer Jake, Zach Galifianakis, and also stars Regan's girlfriend Laura, Andrea Riseborough, 
and first-time Broadway actress Leslie, Naomi Watts. Regan's daughter Sam, Emma Stone, a recovering addict, serves as his assistant. During rehearsals, a light fixture falls onto Ralph, an actor Regan and Jake agree is terrible, Regan tells Jake he caused the light to fall so he could replace Ralph. Through a connection with Leslie, Regan replaces Ralph with the brilliant but volatile method actor Mike, Edward Norton, refinancing his house to fund his contract. The first previews go disastrously, Mike breaks character over the replacement of his gin with water, and attempts to rape Leslie during a sex scene. Regan reads early press coverage and is incensed that Mike has stolen the attention, but Jake encourages him to continue. When Regan catches Sam using marijuana, she tells him he does not matter and his play is a vanity project. Backstage during the final preview, Regan sees Sam and Mike flirting. He accidentally locks himself out of the theater and has to walk in his underwear through Times Square to get back inside, his popularity explodes online. Afterwards, he runs into influential critic Tabitha Dickinson, who tells him she hates Hollywood celebrities who pretend to be actors, and promises to kill his play with a negative review. Regan gets drunk and passes out in the street. The next day, he hallucinates a conversation with Birdman, who tries to convince him to make another Birdman film, and sees himself flying through New York City back to the theater. On opening night, Regan uses a real gun for the final scene in which his character kills himself, and shoots his nose off on stage. He earns a standing ovation from all but Tabitha, who leaves during the applause. In the hospital, Jake tells Regan that Tabitha gave the play a rave review, dubbing his suicide attempt as the creation of a new form of method acting she calls superrealism. After Sam visits Regan, he dismisses Birdman and sees birds, then climbs onto the window ledge, when Sam returns, Regan is gone. She looks down at the street, then up at the sky, and smiles. Cast Michael Keaton as Regan Thompson slash Birdman Edward Norton as Mike Shiner, an acclaimed Broadway actor Emma Stone as Sam Thompson, Regan's daughter and assistant Naomi Watts as Leslie, an actress, and Mike's former girlfriend Zach Galifianakis as Jake, Regan's lawyer and friend Andrea Riseborough as Laura, an actress, and Regan's girlfriend Amy Ryan as Sylvia Thompson, Regan's ex-wife Sam's mother. Lindsay Duncan as Tabitha Dickinson, a top theater critic. Merritt Weaver as Annie, the stage manager. Jeremy Shamos as Ralph. Frank Ridley as Mr. Roth. Catherine O'Sullivan as costume assistant. Damian Young as Gabriel. Production. Conception and writing. The idea of a comedy set in the theater appearing to be filmed in one shot was conceived by Gonzalez in Aratu in a single thought. This said, there were influences behind its components. The comedic aspect came from Gonzalez in Aratu wanting a change, all his previous films were dramas, and after directing Biodiful, he did not want to approach a subject tragically again. The choice to make the film appear as a single shot, on the other hand, resulted from his realization that we live our lives with no editing. By presenting the film like this he could submerge the protagonist in an inescapable reality and take the audience with him. Sharing his idea for a film, Gonzalez Inaritu phoned Argentine writers slash filmmakers Armando Bo and Nicolas Jacobone, as well as playwright Alexander Dinleris, Jr., who had all worked with him on his previous film. The screenwriters were concerned about the one-shot nature of the film, however, and their first reaction was to tell him the movie couldn't work. They weren't the only people he faced resistance from though, huge and important people told him to not even try the project, and he himself described it as almost suicidal, not knowing whether the technique would be successful, and worrying that it would become a distraction. Dein Laris later said that had they truly paused and considered the idea, they may have convinced Gonzalez Inaritu out of it. The project began nonetheless. With Gonzalez Inaritu in Los Angeles, Jacob Ohn and Bo in Buenos Aires, and Dine Laris in New York, work on the script was done mainly through Skype calls and emails. This wasn't necessarily bad however, 
Dine Laris said he believed the best ideas in Birdman came from Skype sessions at 2 in the morning where he and Jacobone were cracking each other up. Incorporating the one-shot feature into the script also made the writing process more involved than usual. Bo said we wrote everything thinking of this one shot, and a lot of decisions that would mostly be taken in the editing room were taken before shooting. A consequence of the one-shot approach was the inability to take out scenes or change their order, so they needed to be very, very sure about what was on the page. These factors meant it took about a year and a half before the final draft was written. You have to be an idiot to do it all in one shot. You have to be an idiot to attempt it. It takes a great, great deal of ignorance to not pay attention to the difficulties and to think you're going to do this. Birdman looks like a good idea now, but a year and a half ago we did not know how we would land. While some aspects of the film, the first frame with Riggan, for instance, went unchanged from Birdman's conception to release, others went through several iterations. One of these was the sequence in which Riggan's thoughts are completely taken over by Birdman. The writers knew it would occur at Riggan's lowest point, so at one stage planned for it to happen after Riggan hears the initial negative press coverage and starts throwing and breaking everything around his dressing room. Another version of the moment saw Riggan trying to drown himself in Central Park and flying out to save himself. The film's ending was also changed halfway through filming. Gonzalez in order to strongly disliked the original ending, and rewrote it with Dine Laris and Jacobone after it came to him in a dream. When questioned about the original ending however, he explained he would never describe it because it was so embarrassing. Dine Laris later leaked the ending though, noting it was set in the theater instead of the hospital, and involved Johnny Depp sitting in Riggan's dressing room. They would not have been able to shoot this version anyway, since Depp wasn't available. The personal experiences of the writers informed aspects of the script. Dinleris' exposure to Broadway shaped the depictions of rehearsals and events backstage, though he admitted to exaggerating these. He also felt his background writing long scenes of dialogue helped since scenes in the film were really more like play scenes. Gonzalez Inaritu influenced many of the film's themes, saying, What this film talks about, I have been through. I have seen and experienced all of it, it's what I have been living through the last years of my life. Dine Laris described this aspect as a laughing look at oneself, although noted it had to be done in a comedic way otherwise it would have been the most unbelievably self-absorbed look at the subject. Themes from Carver's short story What We Talk About When We Talk About Love also influenced the script. During writing Gonzalez Inaritu wanted to find the connection between the themes in Riggan's story and those of Carver's. For this reason it was important to Gonzalez Inaritu that Carver's story be the subject of the play, so found using his work terrifying in case the rights to it were rejected, but no issues arose. Tess Gallagher, the widow of Carver, loved the script and gave the all clear, saying that Carver would be laughing about the film. Casting Michael Keaton was Gonzalez Inaritu's first choice to play Regan Thompson. Gonzalez Inaritu cast several of the leading roles before the film was financed. Among these was the lead role. Early in script development, Inaritu didn't have Keaton in mind, but he had changed his mind by the end. When I finished the script, I knew that Michael was not the choice or option, he was the guy. Inaritu cast Keaton for his depth in a variety of acting styles, he could handle the demands of the stage, up-close work, and comedy and empathy with a profound depth to both. Keaton knew about Birdman before Inaritu contacted him. He was in the middle of production of another project when he learned that Inaritu was making another film. Keaton, a fan of his work, flew home to find out more. Inaritu sent him the script and they discussed it over dinner. The first thing Keaton asked the director was whether he was making fun of him, but after Inaritu explained the role, its technicalities, and the film's production, Keaton agreed to play Riggan. Casting the actor to play Leslie was easier. Naomi Watts had already worked with Inaritu before on 21 Grams and quickly accepted his offer. She was able to work on the movie since she was living in New York at the time. Inaritu called his decision behind casting Galifianakis as Jacobette. Galifianakis met the director's criteria of being lovable and funny, 
but in order to also considered him sensitive, which scored him the role. Emma Stone already knew she wanted to work with Inaratu before she was offered the role of Sam. The script that Inaratu gave her and the rest of the cast came with the photo man on wire, which featured Philippe Petit crossing the Twin Towers on a tightrope. Gonzalez Inaratu told the cast, we are doing that. Once these actors were committed, Inaratu sought funding. He first invited Fox Searchlight Pictures to finance the project, but they turned his offer down because they felt his asking budget was too high. At one stage Megan Ellison of Annapurna Pictures wanted to be involved in the project, but decided against it because, unlike her other films, she had not been involved since the beginning. Gonzalez Inaratu approached Brad Weston, president of New Regency, who accepted the offer. When executive Claudia Lewis of Searchlight heard about the deal, she reconsidered and asked to be included in the deal. Searchlight and New Regency had previously worked together to finance 12 Years a Slave, and they decided to join together for Birdman, financing a budget of $16.5 million. Weston and Lewis developed a close relationship with Inaratu, editing the script with him and switching some of the actors. When they joined production, Josh Brolin was set to play the role of Mike Shiner, but the financiers decided to switch him for Norton because of scheduling conflicts. Inaratu found casting Mike Shiner difficult because he wanted his actors to give a quality of reality in each of them that really projects to the film. He said Norton's experience as a theater actor combined with his self-confidence meant that in a way there was some kind of mental reality to Edward, but Norton believes he was the one who convinced Inaratu to take him on. Norton was a fan of the director's work and impressed with his ability to push outside filmmaking boundaries. Norton heard about Inaratu's project from a friend. Once he got the script, he read it straight through until 3 a.m. Norton said, I laughed so hard I woke people up. Norton wanted to meet Inaratu the next day, and once they met, Norton told him Inaratu he couldn't cast someone who was the embodiment of what the script was taking aim at. Instead, Inaratu's needed to cast someone who has at least a little bit of authentic depth of experience, in this world. Inaratu agreed. Norton was not the only member of the cast who had acted on stage. Ryan, one of the last actors to be cast, was invited because Inaratu had seen her in the play Detroit. Lindsay Duncan had vast experience in the theater world too, and decided to accept the offer to play the critic because of the quality of the script. It's delicious because of the writing. But like Shinner's character, Inaratu found casting Laura difficult. Riseboro met him on a street corner for a cup of tea, and recalling the event, said I told him that I would crawl across hot coals to work with him. Inaratu described Laura as a very wacky, quirky role, but said when Andrea Riseboro did it I knew that it was her, because she did it right in the tone, and she understood who she was, she was not judging. Rehearsal and Filming Benjamin Keynes, Riggan, and Michael Keaton, Birdman, rehearsing the action sequence of the film. Once the writing was finished, Gonzalez Inaritu contacted friend and cinematographer Emmanuel Lubisky to discuss his idea for the film. After reading the script, Lubisky was worried that Gonzalez Inaritu would offer him the job since Birdman had all of the elements of a movie that I did not want to do at all, comedy, studio work, and long takes, but changed his mind after further discussion with the director. The pair had worked together on commercials and a short film in the anthology to each his own cinema, but not on any feature films. Lubisky wanted to be sure that this was a decision Rodrigo Prito, cinematographer of all four of Gonzalez Inaritu's feature films, was comfortable with, but after receiving his blessing, the two headed into pre-production. Lubisky was concerned that no film had been shot in the way Gonzalez Inaritu envisioned, meaning there would be no reference material to look up. The two decided the only way to learn how to shoot it would be to shoot it themselves, so they hired a warehouse in Sony Studios, Los Angeles, and built a proxy stage. The setup was minimal, with canvas and C stands for walls, tape, and a few pieces of furniture to mark out areas. Using a camera and some stand-ins, the duo worked through the movie to see if it was possible. 
Having realized no theater had all the backstage areas they required, they hired Kaufman Astoria Studios in New York. Still, Gonzalez Inaritu wanted to shoot at a Broadway theater, but would have to wait until several weeks into rehearsals before securing St. James Theater. They then went about having the stand-ins read and walk through the script to see how large the set needed to be. Afterwards, they designed and made blueprints of the shots and the blocking of the scenes. The planning was precise. Gonzalez Inaritu said there was no room to improvise at all. Every movement, every line, every door opening, absolutely everything was rehearsed. The actors started rehearsing once this preliminary work was completed, according to Lubisky, they did the scenes with the actors once we kind of knew what the rhythm of the scenes were. He described the atypical approach like an upside-down movie where you do post-production before the production. I know Alejandro is very adamant about kind of keeping the rabbit in the hat and not being super specific about how it was shot, but I will say it took a lot of rehearsal and it was very specific. There was no luxury of cutting away or editing around anything. You knew that every scene was staying in the movie, and like theater, this was it, this was your chance to live this scene. Emma Stone During the blocking of the scenes and rehearsals, Gonzalez Inaritu gathered his longtime editors Douglas Kreiss and Stephen Murioni onto the proxy set, so they could discuss where to remove edits. Production designer Kevin Thompson was on hand too, since many of the shots Gonzalez Inaritu desired required the set to be built in a certain way. For example, Riggins' makeup mirror and desk were constructed so that the camera would see his reflection. Thompson also took into consideration the needs of the crew, for instance designing the stairs a little wider for Steadicam operator Chris Harhoff's foot size. The writers were also involved at this stage, fine-tuning the script to make sure the film was fluid and never stopped. St. James Theatre and Kaufman Astoria Studios in New York were used to film the stage and backstage scenes of Birdman respectively. Once the logistics of the scenes were worked out and they had the timing down, the team headed to Kaufman Studios for more rehearsals, followed by principal photography based exclusively in New York during the spring of 2013. The studios were used to film the backstage areas of the film, including Riggins' dressing room and the theater corridors. St. James Theater was used for two weeks, and was the location for the stage scenes. The bar segments were shot in the Rum House on 47th Street, and 43rd Street was used for the action sequence. Throughout the locations, including the studio, the scenes were lit with natural light, since Lubisky wanted the movie to look as naturalistic as possible. The nighttime scenes were possible to film in this way due to the brightness of New York. Throughout shooting, Ari Alexa cameras were used, with an Alexa M for handheld sequences and an Alexa XT attached to the Steadicam. Neither used matte boxes, however. Steadicam operator Chris Harhoff explained this decision, we didn't want this big black thing gliding into their eyeline. This way we could get very close and get the light past the lens and onto the actor's face. Lubisky, who did all the handheld camera work, had chosen the Alexa M because the camera was very small and allowed him to get into tiny spaces and close to the actors, sometimes filming two inches away from Keaton's face. The camera also allowed recording for such a long period, necessary for the long takes of the movie, that Lubisky went so far as to say the movie would have been impossible to do years before. The cameras were lensed with Leica some Eluxi or Zeiss Master Primes. Lubisky stated that these gave clean images, saying you can have all these lights in the frame and they are not really causing bad flare or things like that. In terms of sizes, they initially trialed in 21 mm but this didn't give Gonzalez Inaritu the intimacy he wanted. The crew instead went to a 18 mm Leica, which was used for the majority of the film. Only when emphasis was needed did they switch the lens to a 14 mm but this was rare. The meticulous timing for the scenes meant that takes were cancelled because of the slightest mishaps. Emma Stone, in an interview with Jimmy Fallon, recalled how a six-minute take of the scene where Regan first meets Mike was ruined after she walked around a corner too quickly. Because of this, the number of takes for a given scene was high, usually 20 for the shorter scenes, 
the takes running smoothly around the 15th. Chris Harhoff described it as a type of dance where everyone would hopefully try to peak all at the same moment. The locations sometimes placed restrictions on the takes too, the live Times Square sequence was shot only twice since they didn't want to attract the attention of tourists. Whenever shooting was taking place however, there was pressure on everyone involved, but the cast had a positive experience. Edward Norton said that normally in movie production half the people can check out due to repetitive aspects, but during the shooting of Birdman everybody's on, the whole thing, and you're all on pins and needles because you're all relying on 40 other people not to drop the ball. Because of this, Stone said the director was able to get the best out of the cast, saying Gonzalez in Aratu's process creates the sort of fury in you, and then you end up realizing that he just got so much out of you that you didn't even know you had. Naomi Watts commented that the atmosphere felt emblematic of how it feels on stage, at least my longtime memories from long ago. Andrea Riseborough, meanwhile, described the process as wonderful, mentioning how it was possible to hear the filming of a sequence from far away before the camera arrived and then the magic happens with you, and then everything leaves you, and everything's silent. Once they successfully completed a take though, it was obvious to everybody involved. Norton said I've never, ever been on a set where every day ended with an enormous, authentic sort of cheer at having made it. You're waiting for the scream from Gonzalez in Aratu and everybody was genuinely excited. Special Effects Rodeo FX worked on the special effects in Birdman, including Riggin's flying sequences, Riggin with his alter ego Birdman following him while strolling down the street, and the attack on the city featuring a strange winged creature, helicopters, and stray missiles. Music The film's music consists entirely of drums and classical pieces. With Rachmaninoff and Tchaikovsky among others, most of the classical composers featured are well known, but Gonzalez in Aratu did not regard the choice of pieces as important, saying I think all those classical pieces are, in a way, great, but honestly if I would have put another good classical piece it would be the same film. Gonzalez in Aratu stated that the classical components come from the world of the play, citing the radio in Riggin's room and the show itself as two sources of the Musi the drum sections comprise the majority of the score however, and were composed by Antonio Sanchez. Gonzalez in Aratu explained the choice by saying they helped to structure scenes, and that the drums, for me, was a great way to find the rhythm of the film. In comedy, rhythm is king, and not having the tools of editing to determine time and space, I knew I needed something to help me find the internal rhythm of the film. He also wanted a score that wouldn't cater to an audience's expectations, which the drums, being more abstract, provided. The official soundtrack was released in October 14, 2014. Jazz drummer Antonio Sanchez composed and recorded the score for the film. Gonzalez Inarito contacted friend and jazz drummer Antonio Sanchez in January 2013, inviting him to compose the score for the film. His reaction to writing a soundtrack using only drums was similar to Lubisky's thoughts of shooting the movie like a single shot, it was a scary proposition because I had no point of reference of how to achieve this. There's no other movie I know that has a score like this. Sanchez had also not worked on a film before, nevertheless, after receiving the script, composed rhythmic themes for each of the characters. Gonzalez Inaritu was looking for the opposite approach however, preferring spontaneity and improvisation. Sanchez then waited until production moved to New York before composing more, where he visited the set for a couple of days to get a better idea of the film. Following this, a week before principal photography, he and Gonzalez Inaritu went to a studio to record some demos. During these sessions the director would first talk him through the scene, then while Sanchez was improvising guide him by raising his hand to indicate an event, such as a character opening a door, or by describing the rhythm with verbal sounds. They recorded around 70 demos, which Gonzalez Inaritu used to inform the pacing of the scenes on set, and once filming was complete, spliced them into the rough cut. Sanchez summarized the process by saying the movie fed on the drums and the drums fed on the imagery. His next work on Birdman was in September, 
where he traveled to Los Angeles to re-record the soundtrack. By this stage the film was assembled, so during the two days of recording Sanchez would watch a scene to see what Gonzalez Inaritu had done with the demos, then redo the track. This was a new experience for Sanchez who until this point, had guided his improvisations in response to the sound and energy around him. Here, he was using a scene to guide him, and said the biggest challenge of the soundtrack was adapting what I do to a moving image, a storyline, and dialogue. As in New York, Gonzalez Inaritu supervised these recordings, but this time would give specific directions. For example, instructing Sanchez to stop or start when Rigan uttered certain words. Gonzalez Inaritu also shaped the overall feel of the soundtrack. He wanted it to grow crazier throughout the film, so for the end track Sanchez would overdub up to four drum tracks on top of each other. Additionally, Gonzalez Inaritu was not satisfied with the quality of the sound from the previous recordings, it was too good. Instead, he wanted an instrument that sounded like it hadn't been played in years, to tie in with state of the theater in the film. To achieve this, Sanchez adjusted his setup, detuning the drums and stacking different kinds of cymbals on top of one another were among the techniques he used. Amusingly, this process was included in the film, the first sound in Birdman is in fact Sanchez asking Gonzalez Inaritu a question in Spanish, followed by his detuning of the drums. In between the two studio recordings, Sanchez was away touring with the Pat Metheny group, which created a complication. Gonzalez Inaritu wanted to include a drummer in the film from the very beginning, saying I wanted Sanchez to become a character in his own film, and have the play become a play of a play. The drummer recommended his friend Nate Smith, but didn't decide on the music to play beforehand, resulting in Smith improvising during the shoots. This meant Sanchez had to learn and match him exactly during the recordings in Los Angeles, Noting Alejandro was very specific and he would watch the clip over and over again to make sure that you could not tell that it was not him that was actually producing the sound. Never in my life have I had to do that. The process was not aided by a different method of recording for the scene outside of St. James Theatre featuring Smith. The drums were moved out onto the street, and people carrying mics a block away would walk towards and pass Sanchez as he was playing, to coordinate the sound and image of the film without the need for post-production effects. Best Original Score Disqualification On December 12, 2014, the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences released their long list for the Academy Award for Best Original Score, from which Birdman was absent. Sanchez had received a note from the award committee the previous day explaining the decision, quoting Rule 15 of the 87th Academy Award Rules and writing they felt the fact that the film also contains over a half an hour of non-original, mostly classical, music cues that are featured very prominently in numerous pivotal moments in the film made it difficult for the committee to accept your submission. Sanchez decided to launch an appeal, and along with Gonzalez Inaritu and the executive vice president of Fox Music, sent letters to the chair of the Academy's music branch executive committee, Charles Fox, asking that the committee reconsider their decision. One of the points they raised was that the committee had incorrectly calculated the ratio of classical to original music, which after being clarified Sanchez thought he was on really solid ground. A response from Fox on December 19, however, explained that a special meeting of the music committee was held, and although its members had great respect for the score and considered it superb, thought that the classical music was also used as scoring, equally contributes to the effectiveness of the film, and that the musical identity of the film was created by both the drums and classical Musi ultimately, they did not overturn their decision. Sanchez said that he and Gonzalez Inaritu were not satisfied with the explanation, and that to not be able to even participate, to not be on the list, that's what's so disappointing. Release On July 10th, 2014, it was announced that Birdman had been selected as the opening film of the 71st Venice International Film Festival along with Mohsen Makamalbaf's new film. The film got a limited release on October 17, 2014, with a theater count of four in North America, and on November 14, 2014, 
it was released nationwide in 857 theaters. Box Office The film earned $424,397 during its limited North America opening in four theaters in New York and Los Angeles on the weekend of October 17, 2014, a per theater average of $106,099, making it the 18th all-time earner, 8th among live-action movies, and ranking number 20. In the second weekend of October 24, 2014, Birdman expanded to 50 theaters and earned $1.38 million, which translates to a $27,593 per theater average. The film expanded nationwide to 857 theaters in the weekend of November 14, 2014, grossing $2,471,471 with a per theater average of $2,884 and ranking number 10. In the same weekend, Birdman grossed $11.6 million. The film opened in Mexico in November 13, 2014, grossing $628,915 in its opening weekend, and opened in United Kingdom on January 2, 2015, grossing $2,337,407 over the weekend. In the United Kingdom, Australia, and Italy, the film grossed $7.6 million, $3.97 million, $1.97 million respectively. As of February 22, 2015 update, Birdman has grossed $76,533,000 worldwide including $37,733,000 in North America and $38,800,000 in other territories against a production budget of $16.5 million. Critical Response Birdman received widespread critical acclaim, particularly for Keaton, Norton, and Stone's performances. At Rotten Tomatoes, it has a rating of 93% based on 254 reviews, with rating average of 8.5-10. The site's critical consensus states, a thrilling leap forward for director Alejandro González Inaritu, Birdman is an ambitious technical showcase powered by a layered story and outstanding performances from Michael Keaton and Edward Norton. Metacritic gave the film a score of 88 out of 100, based on reviews from 49 critics, indicating universal acclaim. The camera work, which depicts most of the film as one continuous take, was met with extensive acclaim for its execution and usage. The acting was widely praised, particularly Keaton, with Peter De Brugge of Variety calling the performance the comeback of the century. De Brugge described the film as a self-aware showbiz satire and called it a triumph on every creative level. Robbie Collin of the Daily Telegraph gave the film five-fifths, with particular praise for the use of long takes by Emmanuel Lubisky, director of photography. Richard Roper gave the film an A, and wrote that Keaton makes a serious case for an Academy Award for Best Actor nomination. Writing for The New Yorker, Richard Brody called the film Godard Diane, comparing it to Piero Elifu, Every Man for Himself, Alphaville, and Germany Year 1990, four classic films by French director Jean-Luc Godard. However, he suggested the film fell short of reaching the same cinematic mastery, adding, it's not a good idea for a filmmaker to get in the ring with Mr. Goddard. Thematically, he also compared it to Opening Night by John Cassavetes. He added that the actors played in the sort of modern naturalism, without eccentricity of gesture, excess of expression, or heightened and formalistic precision, that is the business casual of contemporary cinema. He concluded that the film trade on facile, casual dichotomies of theater versus cinema and art versus commerce and deliver a work of utterly familiar and unoriginal drama. Also in The New Yorker, Anthony Lane rejected the film's suggestion that film critics are out to destroy films, explaining, someone could have told Inaritu that critics, though often mean, are not preemptively so, and that anybody who said, as Tabitha does, I'm going to destroy your play, before actually seeing it, would not stay long in the job. In the New York Times, Manala Dargis compared the main character to Icarus. 
She also noted a reference to Susan Sontag's against interpretation in the dressing room mirror. Noting the thematic pull between Riggins' insanity or actual superpowers, Travis Lako Yuta of First Things writes that the importance of these powers real or imagined is apparent, they are for Riggin the thing beyond the labels, the kernel of his genius and, because he sees drawing upon them as selling out, the source of his great angst. Lako Uter concludes that the quirky profundity of this film is in how it dares the viewer to consider the everyday magic that we tend to ignore, repress, or resent. A number of critics have provided highly negative reviews, however. Reviewing it for Vanity Fair, Richard Lawson called the film hoary and deceptively simple. Scott Tobias, writing for The Dissolve, gave the film 1.5 stars. He commends Lubisky cinematography as succeeding at trapping viewers in a pressure cooker atmosphere as Regan and his players struggle to keep it together, but suggests that Gonzalez Inaritu is incapable of modulation and that there exists a sourness to Birdman that Inaritu can't turn into wit. Accolades Main article, list of accolades received by Birdman, film Michael Keaton received his first Golden Globe Award, winning for Best Actor in a Motion Picture, musical or comedy at the 72nd Golden Globe Awards. For the 87th Academy Awards, Birdman tied with the Grand Budapest Hotel in the highest number of nominations with nine, including Best Picture, Sound Editing, Sound Mixing, Original Screenplay, Cinematography and Best Actor for Keaton. Emma Stone and Edward Norton were nominated in Best Supporting Acting Categories. Alejandro Gonzalez Inaritu won for Best Director. The film won Academy Awards for Best Picture, Best Director, Best Original Screenplay and Best Cinematography. Year-end lists. Birdman appeared on over 100 critics' top 10 lists of the best films of 2014, with over a few dozen publications ranking the film first in their lists. First, James Vernier, Boston Herald. First, Clint O'Connor, Cleveland Plain Dealer. First, Brad Brevet, Rope of Silicon. First, Chris Stuckman, Chris Stuckman Movie Reviews.